This video will cover the respiratory system. Let's take a quick look at the respiratory system. We're already familiar with some parts of it. You already know we have lungs and so on. Uh, but if you take a look at the system, you'll notice a couple of things. One thing is that the entrance and the exit is exactly the same. Air comes in through the nose and mouth. Air goes out through the nose and mouth. The lungs are completely enclosed inside the thoracic cavity. You should also remember that there's a pair of membranes that surround each lung. Those are called the pleura. And we'll talk about all those things a little bit later on. But before we look at the respiratory system, let's think about why we even have one. Why do you have a respiratory system? Well, the most obvious thing, the most obvious function of the respiratory system is gas exchange. And the gases we're talking about are oxygen and carbon dioxide. You probably already know that we require oxygen to make ATP. And in the process of making ATP, we create carbon dioxide, which is a waste product. So we have to get rid of that. Well, this happens in the lungs. And so we do gas exchange. We exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. But that's not all the respiratory system does. It also helps us to sense of smell. Chemicals are travel through the air and we have these organs inside the nose that uh, are pick up those chemicals and send those messages to the brain for analysis. We also use the respiratory system when we talk. We push air through the respiratory system across the vocal cords. And the vocal cords vibrate and that's how we create sounds. We also can get rid of stuff through the respiratory system. We can get rid of heat and we can also get rid of excess water. If you think about what happens if you blow on a mirror, it fogs up. Well, the reason it fogs is because our breath is warm and it's very, very, very moist. Now, we get rid of water, but not to a great exchange. Some animals, though, depend on this as their primary way of getting rid of heat. Think about a dog panting. Another thing the respiratory system does is it helps us to keep our blood pH within normal uh, limits. Remember, blood pH is very tightly regulated. It only uh, ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. Well, two organs are primarily uh, responsible for maintaining that blood pH. Those are the kidneys and the lungs. With every breath that we take, we adjust our acid-base balance. We adjust our pH. And you can change the pH just by breathing more and more deeply or less or holding your breath. If you hold your breath, your blood will become more acidic. If you pant like the dog, your blood will become more basic. And then finally, we don't want anything getting into the body that's potentially dangerous. And so the best way to prevent that is just to keep it from happening. And so we intercept these dangerous airborne agents before they get a chance to get into our blood or body systems. So that's the functions of the respiratory system. Here you can see the lungs and the respiratory system in a cadaver. And if you notice here, you'll notice that the right lung is larger than the left lung. And you should remember that this is because of the position of the heart. Remember the heart is two thirds to the left of center which makes the left lung have less space and so has to be smaller. And you can see that the area where the heart sits, there's a cutout in the lung and that's called the cardiac notch. And we'll see that again later on as well. well when we talk about the respiratory system, like most systems, we like to divide it up and classify it. It makes it easier to talk about. Well, there's two ways to do this. There's an anatomical way and a physiological way. The anatomical way divides the respiratory system up into two parts. One part is the upper respiratory system or upper respiratory tract. And basically that includes everything above your Adam's apple. So if you can find your Adam's apple, which is called the larynx, everything above that, which includes things like the nose, the nasal cavity, and the pharynx, that's an upper respiratory uh, tract. So if you get a head cold or you get a sinus infection, 
Those are upper respiratory infections. The lower respiratory system or the lower respiratory tract begins at the larynx. It begins at your Adam's apple and then it includes everything plus the larynx and below. So that includes things like the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the little tiny, tiny little air sacs in the lungs, which are called alveoli. So if we look at this, you can see the upper respiratory and lower respiratory tracts. This is kind of an artificial way to do this. Um, it's convenient because the larynx is easy to find, but it really doesn't define very much. So there's another way to classify the respiratory system too, and this is a physiological classification. Remember, physiology is all about function. And we already said the primary function of the respiratory system was gas exchange. And so when we do this physiological classification or divisions, we get two of these as well. One of these is where no gas exchange takes place. In other words, there's no exchange of oxygen or carbon dioxide at all. Basically, this is just a bunch of pipes. It's a bunch of pipes that are bringing the air down into a place where we can do gas exchange. This is called the conducting zone. The conducting zone is going to include most of the respiratory system. Where we do get gas exchange is called the respiratory zone. And the respiratory zone exists deep inside the lungs. It only consists of a few things. It consists of some bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and alveoli, those little air sacs. So if we look at that, we can see this is the conducting zone. Look, it's a bunch of pipes. And the pipes divide and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But there's still pipes. There's no gas exchange that happens in here. The air in here there's no gas exchange. Sometimes this is called dead space. And we'll see that a little bit later as well. If you look at the respiratory zone, though, you have to go deep inside the lungs. It's microscopic, and so we need to use a microscope to see it. So in this picture to the far left, you can see a bronchus and a bronchiole. That's part of the conducting zone. No gas exchange. It's not until you get to these respiratory bronchioles the alveolar ducts, and the little tiny air sacs, which you see hundreds of them in this picture, the alveoli, that's the respiratory zone. Well, when we talk about respiration, if I just said that word to most of you, you would think of breathing, and that is part of respiration, but it's not the total. There are several different processes of respiration. It takes place in distinct different processes and it must happen. Well, when we think of respiration, again, we think of breathing, but that is actually called ventilation. And ventilation is when we move air into and out of the lungs. But remember, it's not air that we're after, it's gases. Remember the gases that we're most interested in are oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so we need to move those gases out of the lungs and into the blood. That's the second process of respiration. And it's called external respiration. So external respiration is gas exchange. It's gas exchange that happens at the lungs and it's between air and blood. But again, that's not what we're interested in. That Those gases don't need to stay in the lungs. They have to go to the cells where they can be utilized. And so we have to move the gases. We have to carry the oxygen to the cells. We have to bring the carbon dioxide back from the cells. And so that's the process of transport. But even in the blood, that's not where we want these gases. We want them in the cells. And so we're gonna have to do gas exchange again. This happens in the tissues, and it's called internal respiration. So internal respiration is a gas exchange, again, but this time it's between blood and tissues. And then finally, the gases that we're interested in either get to or are removed from the tissues. But when oxygen gets into the tissues, into our cells, that's where we actually have true respiration.
It's called cell respiration. And you spend a bunch of time talking about cell respiration back in general biology. Remember, it was all about Krebs cycle and electron transport system. It's all about using the oxygen in the production of ATP. Remember, we break down carbon, uh, glucose into carbon dioxide and water. Well, in order to do that, it requires oxygen. And we use six oxygens for every molecule of glucose. So if we look at those processes, we can divide them up into two groups. Remember, we have the uh, respiration system. This is ventilation and external respiration. And then we have internal respiration. And what links them together is transport. So if you think about this, there's more than one system involved in respiration. There's the respiratory system, but also the circulatory system. And then finally, remember, what we're going to do with that is we're going to use the oxygen in the production of ATP. So let's look at the anatomy of the respiratory system. And we're just going to start at the top. We'll start with the nose. Well, when we think of our nose, we mostly think of what's external. The nose itself uh, is made of two small bones. We know those as the nasal bones, but most of our nose is made of, of cartilage and connective tissue. The cartilage, remember, is hyaline cartilage, and we have this dense connective tissue. And there are two openings to the nose. Most of us would call those nostrils, but they're technically called uh, external nares. So, but as soon as the air gets into the nose, we begin to change it. So the nose uh, is sort of a filtering chamber. And if you look at the very beginning part of the nose, there are hairs there to block out large particles. It's also where our olfactory receptors are. And so that's where we're going to detect the chemicals in air. It also helps us with speech. It serves as a resonating chamber. So if you think about what happens if you plug up your nose and talk, like you have a bad cold, if I do it, listen how different my voice sounds. It sounds like this. So without the nose, your voice sounds very different because it acts as this resonating chamber. From the nose, we go into the nasal cavity. And so if you look at the nasal cavity, it extends from those nostrils, those external nares, to another set of openings called internal nares. Well, inside the nasal cavity are the superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchi. Collectively, these are called turbinates. And the reason they're called that is because they create turbulence in the air. As soon as the air comes into the nasal cavity, it begins to roll and tumble and spin inside the nasal cavity. Well, that's important because we want air to come into contact with the surfaces. The surfaces of the nasal cavity are very moist. The tissue is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Remember, this is ciliated. And there are lots and lots of goblet cells in this tissue. So this tissue is warm, it's wet, it's sticky, and it has these cilia. And so as the air turb, uh, creates turbulence in there, as it spins and rolls, it comes into contact with this tissue. And this tissue then helps to clean it, it helps to warm it, it helps to hydrate it. And so you can see here the nasal cavity. So again, it extends from the external nares to the internal nares. And then you can see these superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchi. In between those conchi are little tunnels, if you will, and those are called meatuses. So there's a superior, middle, and inferior meatus as well. If we look at that from a different view, this is a coronal section. So you can see here in the very center is the nasal septum, that blue. And then you can see these conchi. And look, they create turbulence because they're not shaped flat. They're shaped with all these curly Q sort of things. And so you can see this, the pseudostratified columnar epithelium lining all of this tissue. 
And so the nasal cavity is not one big open space. It's much smaller, and the, the air has to roll and tumble. And again, turbulence is created in order for the air to pass through here. If you breathe through your mouth, you don't have this same situation. And so the air coming from your mouth is not as clean as the air that goes through your nose. And so most of the time, all day, all night, we should be breathing through our nose. We only breathe through the mouth if you're exercising or if you have some sort of infection where your nose is closed up. Here's that pseudostratified columnar epithelium. You can see the goblet cells. You can see the cilia. And so dust and bacteria and all that sort of stuff gets trapped in this mucus, which is secreted from those goblet cells. And then the cilia move the mucus to the back of your throat and you swallow it. Well, once you swallow it, it goes into the digestive system and the digestive system either kills the bacteria or it's excreted at the other end. We also have sinuses, and sinuses are attached to the nasal cavity. So they're called paranasal sinuses. Para means next to. They're named for the bone that they're located in. Remember, sinuses are hollow, air-filled spaces located in bones. And so we have frontal sinuses in the frontal bone sphenoidal sinuses in the sphenoidal bone, ethmoidal, ma maxillary. And you can see these in this picture here. Well, they have the exact same kind of tissue that you find in the nasal cavity. So they're lined with this pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And they do the exact same things. They warm the air, they hydrate the air, they clean the air. And they also, like the nose, serve as resonating chambers. From the nasal cavity, we go into the pharynx. The word pharynx just means throat. It's sort of a funnel-shaped tube. It's made out of skeletal muscle, and then it's covered in different uh, epithelial tissues. Superior, it's connected to the nasal cavity. Inferiorly, it's connected to the larynx and esophagus. So if we look at it, we can see what it looks like. It extends from the base of the skull down to the sixth cervical vertebra. And you can see it here. It begins at those internal nares and ends right at the level of the, of the larynx. If we look at it in a different picture, it looks like this. In this picture, you can see that it's divided up into three sections. These three sections are nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Well, they're different from each other. Let's look at them individually. If you look at the nasopharynx, the nasopharynx is connected to the nasal cavity, and the nasopharynx has the exact same sort of tissue that's found in the nasal cavity. And so it's strictly a passageway for air. You should never have food or liquid going through here. And if it ha does happen, it actually is uncomfortable. It burns. It hurts. That's because this tissue here is very, very thin. It's pseudostratified columnar epithelium, just like in the nasal cavity. And it looks like this. And so the distance between whatever it is that you've uh, gotten into the, na the nasopharynx and the tissue below is very, very, very thin. If you look at the other two parts of the pharynx, though, they're different, and that's because they're shared spaces. Remember, the nasopharynx is supposed to have air only, but the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx are shared spaces. So not only does air go through here, but so does food and liquid. And so the tissue is very, very different. If you look at the oropharynx, it extends from the into uh, the soft palate, basically to the epiglottis. Food and liquid go through an arched opening called the fauces, which connects the oral cavity to the oropharynx. Remember, this is a shared pathway. So not only does air go through here, but so does food and liquid. 
Well, food and liquid are both more abrasive than air, and so the tissue has to be accommodating to that. So the tissue here is not pseudostratified columnar epithelium, it's stratified squamous epithelium. Remember, stratified squamous epithelium has many, many, many layers. Now, it doesn't have keratin, but it's still adapted for abrasion. But this is the wet variety. You can see nuclei up in the top parts. The stratified squamous is food and liquid go by here. Some cells may get rubbed off due to abrasion. But if, if that happens, there's still tons of more cell layers. Um, before you get down into the place where there's blood vessels and nerves. This tissue is constantly growing, and so we're constantly uh, developing it to the lower levels, or cells are being pushed up, and eventually they slough off or they're rubbed off. The same thing is true for the laryngopharynx. It's also this shared pathway. But if you look at the laryngopharynx, Right where it happens, two pathways split apart. One pathway, the esophagus, is for food and liquid. The other pathway, the larynx and trachea, is for air. And so if you look at the laryngopharynx, it's sort of like an upside-down V. Again, it's this common pathway for food and liquid and air. It's just posterior to the epiglottis. Right there at the larynx, the two pathways uh, diverge, but this is still pharynx, and so it's still stratified squamous epithelium. It's still adapted to resist abrasion. From the pharynx, air enters the larynx. Sometimes the larynx is called the voice box because this is where our vocal cords are. There are basically three functions of the larynx. One is to provide an open or patent airway. This, air, this pathway must stay open because air flows back and forth constantly. The average person breathes about 15 times a minute, and so it has to be able to pass through very easily. The only time that this is closed is when we're swallowing food or liquid. And so that's the next function of the larynx is to act sort of like a switching mechanism so that we route the food and air into their proper channels. And what we're going to see here is there's sort of a trap door that closes when we're swallowing to prevent food from entering into the larynx and trachea. And then the third function of the larynx, remember this is where our vocal cords are, and so this is where voice production happens. So, provide an open or patent airway, provide this switching mechanism to keep food and liquid out of the respiratory tract, and then to, to uh, function in voice production. And so if we look at the larynx, it's mostly cartilages. They're hyaline cartilages, most of them. There are nine of them, nine cartilages. There are three that are single cartilages, and there are three that are in pairs. Let's look at the hyaline cartilages first. So two of the three single cartilages are hyaline. The largest of the cartilages is called the thyroid cartilage. And the thyroid cartilage is where the Adam's apple is. There's a midline uh, part that pokes out. It's, so it's called the midline laryngeal prominence. And you can see it and you can feel it. The other one is called the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage is a complete circle, unlike any of the others. It completely encircles the tube. And then there are three much smaller pairs of cartilages. They're called the arytenoid, the cuneiform, and the corniculate cartilages. The ninth cartilage is made out of a, or ninth cartilage is a different type. It's elastic cartilage. This is called the epiglottis. If you remember, epi means on top of. The word glottis refers to the opening 
that goes down into the trachea. And so epiglottis, epi on top of, glottis, that opening. In other words, this is forms a cover over the opening when you're swallowing. If we look at the cartilage, this is an anterior view. You can see, first of all, up at the top, you can see the hyoid bone. This is not part of the larynx, but the larynx is attached to it. If you put your fingers or your hand on your neck and swallow, you'll feel this move up and down as you swallow. Right above that, you can see the tip of this epiglottis. And then coming down, you can see in the anterior view, the thyroid cartilage is sort of shield-shaped. You can see that Adam's apple or laryngeal prominence. And then below that, between the rest of the larynx and the trachea is the cricoid. Well, remember the cricoid is a complete circle. It's actually smaller in the front than it is in the posterior. If we look at this in a... Uh, anterior view and then a medial view, you can see what it looks like uh, in a section. So this is a sagittal section. So if you look, you can see the thyroid cartilage. It goes about two thirds of the way around. And then you can see the cricoid. Look, it's smaller in the anterior and larger in the posterior. You can also see those smaller cartilages the cuneiforms, the corniculates, and the arytenoids. Those are named for their shape. Cuneiform means wedge, so they look wedge-shaped. Corniculate means horn-like, like the horns on a cow. And so they're very small and they're shaped like horns. And then arytenoid means sail-shaped, like a sailboat sail. You can also, in this view, see the rest of the epiglottis. Now, remember, it's covered in epithelial tissue, but it's made out primarily of elastic cartilage. And you can see how it forms like a lid that can fold down over the opening, the glottis. In this view, you can also see the vocal cords, and we'll talk about those in just a second. Down at the very bottom, you can see trachea, and trachea also has cartilages as well. If we blow that up, you can see it all a little bit better. So you can see the hyoid, you can see this epiglottis, you can see the three smaller paired cartilages, you can see the thyroid and cricoid cartilage, and you can also see the vocal cords. Let's talk about those vocal cords. Technically, they're called vocal ligaments. They're made from dense, regular connective tissue, just like other ligaments. They attach to the arytenoid cartilages. Well, when you look at them, they have elastic fibers in them, and they stretch. There are also these mucosal folds that fold over and around them. Well, what happens is, we stretch them or relax them, and then we force air across them. And when you force air across them, they vibrate. A good analogy for this is a guitar. You think about a guitar with guitar strings. The way you make the guitar make sound is you pluck the strings and they vibrate. Well, with a guitar, you use your fingers or a pick or something like that, but with vocal cords, we force air. So as air rushes up from the lungs, it causes those vocal cords to vibrate. If you look down into someone's larynx, you can see the big opening on the left side. That opening is that glottis. So the glottis is what air passes through. Well, with muscles, we can adjust the size of the glottis. We can have it wide open like the picture on the left. We can also close it completely like the picture on the right. On each side of the glottis are the vocal cords. Remember, vocal cords are elastic ligaments is what they are. And so as air moves across them, they vibrate. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see the vocal cords, and they're closed here. The glottis is closed. 
And so no air would be able to get through there, but you could open it just a tiny bit and force air through. And think about what happens if you blow up a balloon and then you let the air out just a little at a time. The top part of the balloon where the air is coming out vibrates and you hear noise, you hear sound. That's where sound is produced. Well, we can change the pitch of our sound and the way we change the pitch is by either stretching or relaxing the vocal cords and so we use muscles to do that if you look on the lateral sides of the vocal cords you'll see mucosal folds that prevent the air from moving on the opposite side these are called false vocal cords sometimes or ventricular folds so if you look at these false vocal cords, they're just there to prevent air from moving on the opposite side of the vocal cord. They don't produce any sound. They don't have any part in sound production. They're just there to block the air. Here again, you can see, and you can see the epiglottis. You can see the vocal cords, you can see the glottis, you can see all of this in this picture. Here you can also see that these vocal cords are different lengths. This is not two different people, this is the same person. But what happens is when you change the pitch of the sound that you want to produce is done by either stretching or relaxing the vocal cord. The same way with the guitar. If you tighten the strings or loosen the strings, you change the pitch. But remember, vocal, uh, a guitar has six strings and they're all different thicknesses. If you think about the pitch that each one has, the thicker the string, the lower the pitch. And so different people have different thicknesses of vocal cords. The thicker the vocal cord, the lower the pitch. And in general, anyway, males have thicker vocal cords than females. And children have thinner vocal cords than either one. So the people with the highest pitch voices are children. And in general, the people with the lowest pitch voices are adult men. Another thing that happens is at puberty is the length of the vocal cord changes as well. And also longer, longer vocal cords give you a deeper pitch. So if you look at a child's vocal cords, they're very short and very thin. If you look at a, an adult male's vocal cords, they're very long and very thick. So what we do is we push air through the glottis, we open and close it, and as we do that, the vocal cords vibrate and produce sound. We change the pitch by changing the length and the tension on the vocal cords. We change the loudness by how forcefully we push air across the vocal cords. So when you speak very loudly, you're pushing air rapidly and forcefully across the vocal cords. And then once that happens, that sound is manipulated. We resonate it, we amplify it, we shape it. We shape it with our tongue, our pharynx, our lips, our soft palate. And so we produce what we think of as voice. Now, if you're watching this on your own, you can click on these and it'll take you to YouTube videos and you can watch people's vocal cords while they speak and while they sing. Look at these vocal cords. They are inflamed. Remember inflammation? There are four cardinal signs, which is heat, redness, swelling, and pain. And look what happens to the vocal cords. The tissues around the vocal cords swell and the, the sound becomes muffled. It changes the tone completely. This is what happens when you get laryngitis.
From the larynx, air enters the trachea. And so if you look at the trachea, which is sometimes called the windpipe, it looks like this. And basically all it is is a conducting pipe. Air comes in and travels down into the lungs. Now the air continues to be cleaned, continues to be warmed, it continues to be hydrated. And so when you look at this trachea, because we're creating negative pressures, it has to be strong. It also needs to be flexible and mobile because we move our neck and head around a lot. And so if you think about the trachea, it's very similar to a vacuum cleaner hose. If you think about a vacuum cleaner hose, usually there's something like wire running through it to make it stronger, but it's very flexible and movable. And that's exactly the way the trachea is. But it isn't wire going through it, it's cartilage. So when you look at the trachea, you see three layers. There's a mucosa, it's got the same kind of tissue that we found up in the nasal cavity and in the sinuses. This is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. There's a submucosa, which is dense connective tissue. And then there's an outermost layer, which is called the adventitia, and this is where we're going to find hyaline cartilage. They're sort of C-shaped. Sometimes they're called rings, but they're not really a ring. They don't extend all the way around. So if you look in this picture, you can see those layers. You can also see the esophagus, which is posterior to the trachea. If you notice, there's no cartilage on the posterior side of the trachea. Instead, there's a muscle. Well, the reason there's no cartilage there is because when you swallow food, you would not want ridges because those ridges would catch the food and prevent smooth swallowing. The tracheolus muscle can contract and change the diameter of the trachea. When you're at rest, you don't need very much air, and so you want the air to be as clean as possible. And so we close up the trachea so that more of the air comes into contact with that pseudostratified columnar epithelium. But when you're exercising or doing something of that nature, you need a lot of air. And so this muscle relaxes and the trachea becomes wide open so that air can get in and out very easily. When you're exercising, we're more concerned with the am amount of air than how clean it is. Here's another view of the trachea. And again, you can see these layers. So you can see this mucosa, which is the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. You can see the submucosa. Remember, this is dense connective tissues. And then you can see the adventitia with the hyaline cartilage. As you continue down the trachea, the trachea then splits, and it splits into two bronchi. Well, the very bottom of the trachea, right where it splits, is called the carina. And the carina is a special little place. First of all, it's the end of the trachea and the beginning of the bronchi, but the carina has lots and lots and lots of nerve endings. Those nerve endings are very sensitive to anything that could get down into the trachea liquid food, anything like that. And what happens is if something stimulates those nerve endings, then we cough like crazy. Because once you get past the trachea, it's very difficult to get anything out of the respiratory system. So if you actually swallow food and it makes it all the way down into the bronchi, it's very, very difficult to extract. But by the time you get to the bronchi, We've warmed up the air, we've hydrated it, it's saturated with water vapor, and hopefully there are no impurities in there as well. If we look at the bronchi, they continue to divide and get smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you count how many times they divide, it's 23 times. 
each time getting very, very small. And so if you look at it, it looks a lot like a tree. And that's somewhat, sometimes what it's called, a bronchial tree. It looks a lot like a tree, especially if you turn it upside down. It really looks like a tree. But again, if you count how many times it branches, 23 times. Well, in the upper part of the bronchi, the walls are very similar to the trachea. But as you go deeper and deeper, you get structural changes happening. The amount of cartilage in the bronchi decreases. The amount of smooth muscle in the bronchi increases. And then the epithelium also changes. It changes from pseudostratified columnar to simple columnar to simple cuboidal to simple squamous. The deeper you go, the less and less cartilage there is, the more muscle there is, and the thinner the epithelium is. Let's look at the first bronchi. The first bronchi, there are two of them. They're called primary bronchi. There's a left one and a right one. They're not exactly the same. The left primary bronchus is smaller in diameter and more horizontal, whereas the right primary bronchus is larger in diameter. Remember, the right lung is larger. And it's also more vertical. So if you do happen to get food or something down into the trachea and bronchi, it almost always enters the right primary bronchus rather than the left primary bronchus. Here you can see those bronchi, and you can see just how different they are. When you look at the left, it's narrower and, again, more horizontal. But if you look at the right, it's larger in diameter and more vertical. Those bronchi then continue to divide. And we're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The first division after the prim primary is the secondary bronchi. So secondary bronchi, each secondary bronchus enters a lobe of the lung. Remember, the left lung is smaller, and it only has two lobes, so there are only two left secondary bronchi. On the right one, though, remember the right lung is bigger, and it has three lobes, so there are three right secondary bronchi. And you can see them, and then they continue and divide and divide and divide. Eventually, remember, we have less and less cartilage and more and more smooth muscle. Well, at some point you get to the to place where there's no cartilage and there's lots of smooth muscle. Now we don't call those bronchi anymore. They're called bronchioles. So bronchi have cartilage, bronchioles, no cartilage. They have a complete circular layer of smooth muscle. They have an epithelial tissue that's cuboidal. And remember, no cartilage and no mucus secreting cells. So if you look at a bronchiole, it looks like this. You can see these bands of smooth muscle, and they go all the way around. Well, when muscle contracts, it changes the internal diameter of the bronchiole. And so bronchioles can get smaller or get larger, depending on whether or not the muscle is contracted. We call this, call this bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. It's very similar to what we saw with blood vessels. Remember in blood vessels, it's called vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And remember in blood vessels, when we talked about it, if you decrease the radius, you make flow go down. And that's exactly what happens here. It's not blood flowing through here, it's air. But air flows exactly the same way. And if you look, remember the equation for flow. The equation for flow here is exactly the same. The autonomic nervous system is in control of this smooth muscle. 
The parasympathetic causes the smooth muscle to contract and causes vasoconstriction. The sympathetic nervous system causes the smooth muscle to relax and causes vasodilation. The bronchioles continue to divide and divide and divide. They're still part of the conducting zone, but eventually we get to the very smallest bronchioles. These are called respiratory bronchioles, and this is the beginning of the respiratory zone. So the respiratory zone includes the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. Alveoli are tiny little sort of hollow grape-like structures, and there's about 300 million of them in each lung. And they account for almost all of the volume of the lung. This is where we're going to get most of the gas exchange. And so it's a huge surface area for gas exchange. If you took the alveoli out of one person's lung and flattened them all out and put them side by side, they would cover about the size of a doubles tennis court. In this picture you can see, if you look over to the left where it's blue, that's cartilage. And so those are bronchioles. But when you get to the part where there's no blue left, those are bronchioles. Bronchioles, remember, have no cartilage and they have lots of smooth muscle. But look, they continue to divide and divide and divide. The very last bronchiole of the conducting zone is called the terminal bronchiole. Terminal means last, the last part of the conducting zone. And then beyond that, we have the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. That's the respiratory zone. If you look at the alveoli, look at them. They look like hollow grapes. And just like grapes come in bunches, so do alveoli. Each bunch is called an alveolar sac. If we look at it under a microscope, you can see the same thing. You can see the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. And remember, a sac is a bunch of alveoli. Notice how the alveoli have holes in them that connect them to the other alveoli around. These are called alveolar pores, and they allow for the equilibration of pressures through the alveoli, so air can flow from one alveolus to another. In this picture, you can see the terminal bronchial. And look, you can see the bands of smooth muscle around it. And then again, you can see the respiratory bronchiole and so on. But look at the alveoli. The alveoli are like these little hollow grapes, but they're made out of simple squamous epithelium, which makes them very, very, very thin. Air comes into them just like air goes into a balloon. Well, think about what happens if you blow too much air into a balloon. It pops. And if too much air were to come into the alveolus, it would also pop. Well, one thing that's present to prevent them from rupturing is that there are tiny little elastic fibers around every alveolus. You can kind of think of them like little rubber bands. So if you took a balloon and you blew it up and blew it up, eventually it would pop. But if you put rubber bands around that balloon and you tried to blow it up, the rubber bands would resist the increase in size, and it probably would be very, very hard or difficult for you to make it pop. And that's exactly the way these are, too. So these elastic fibers prevent over distension and rupture of these alveoli. Another thing you'll see around all the alveoli are capillaries. So remember, capillaries are the tiniest little blood vessels and the capillaries touching the alveoli, that's where we're going to get gas exchange. 
So if we were to blow that up even more, we would see those little fibers, we would see those pores, we would see the cells inside it, and we would see that it looks like this. Again, you can see these elastic fibers, little rubber bands. We can see these capillaries. And look, the capillaries do not completely cover the surface of the alveolus. The only place we're going to get gas exchange is where the capillary touches the alveolus. If we blow that up and look at it, look, not everywhere do you see capillaries, just in a few places. Again, we only get gas exchange where the capillary touches the alveolus. And here you can see, this is a scanning electron micrograph, you can see those capillaries. And look, there are a lot of open spaces in between the capillaries. Well, when we look at a capillary, we're going to see three different types of cells. The most common type of cell that we're going to see is the pink ones. These are called type 1 cells. So type 1 cells are simple squamous epithelium. It's very, very thin, and this is where we're going to get diffusion of gases or gas exchange. But again, it does not happen everywhere. It only happens where the capillary touches the alveolus. So on the left side, you can see the alveolus, and you can see one, two, three, four, five, six capillaries. Well, if we blow one of those up, if you look on the right side, you'll see the alveolus and you'll see the capillary and you can see where they touch each other. That's where gas exchange happens and that is called the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane is where the capillary touches the alveolus, where we get gas exchange. And if you look at this respiratory membrane, you will see layers. There's the wall of the alveolus. There's the wall of the capillary. And then there's a fused basement membrane between them. So they're sort of glued together so that they don't separate. Well, if you look back on the left, we can see a respiratory membrane one, two, three, four, five, six on this one alveolus. But you can also see lots of empty spaces where there's no gas exchange. Another type of cell that we see here are called type 2 cells. Type 2 cells, sometimes they're called septal cells. They're not squamous, they're cuboidal. Remember, cuboidal tissue is good at doing things like diffusion, or sorry, secretion, and that's exactly what they do here. They secrete, and they secrete a product which is called surfactant. In this picture, they're the green cells. And they're called septal cells because they're on the wall. But they're called type 2 cells, and these type 2 cells secrete surfactant. We'll talk about what surfactant is just a little bit later but it's a product that's going to aid in respiration. There's one other type of cell here, and you can see these. These are purple in this picture. These are called alveolar macrophages. Sometimes they're called dust cells. Macro means big. Phage means to eat. These are big eaters. And what they're eating is dust. So they remove the dust, the pathogens, anything that you breathed in and it's made it all the way down here. They're sort of like little vacuum cleaners that roam around inside the alveolus and clean up the stuff that's not supposed to be there. So we have these three types of cells. Type 1 cells, simple squamous. That's where we get diffusion of gases. Type 2 cells, simple cuboidal. Those secrete surfactant. And then alveolar macrophages are white blood cells that roam around and remove the stuff that's not supposed to be there. Well, remember we have about 300 million of these alveoli in each lung. And so remember that if we flatten them out, we have this huge surface area for diffusion. Again, 
Diffusion only happens, gas exchange only happens where the capillary touches the alveolus, and that's where we have the respiratory membrane. So if you look at the respiratory membrane, remember it's uh, composed of layers. We have the alveolar wall or epithelium. We have the capillary wall or epithelium. We have this fused basement membrane between the alveoli and the capillary. And then we have this thin, thin, thin layer of surfactant. Well, surfactant is a detergent is what it is. What it does is it reduces the cohesiveness of water. So if we go back and look at this picture, these are tiny, tiny, tiny little hollow grape-like structures, and they're wet on the surface, on ins the inside. Well, if you think about what happens when you put two wet structures close together, they stick. Think about two wet dinner plates. If they're wet, they stick together, and they're really hard to get apart. Well, the exact same thing would happen if these two wet surfaces were allowed to get close to each other. The water from one wet surface would attract the water from the other wet surface, and they would stick together. In other words, the alveolus would collapse. And just like trying to get those two plates apart, trying to get these collapsed alveolus reinflated would be really, really difficult. Well, we can prevent that from happening by applying a detergent. Same thing as if you wash dishes in the sink. You apply some sort of detergent in there so that you can reduce the cohesiveness of water and allow the, the food particles and so on to dissolve in the water. You might use Dawn dishwashing liquid or something like that when you're washing dishes. But in the lungs, we use this product called surfactant. So surfactant reduces the cohesiveness of water and prevents those little alveoli from collapsing. Again, we have this respiratory membrane. This is where we're going to get gas exchange. Gas exchange happens by diffusion. So oxygen moves from high concentration to low concentration. Carbon dioxide moves from its high concentration to its low concentration. And so if you look in the picture, they're moving in opposite directions, but they're mo both moving down their gradient. And so when we see blood flowing through here, when it approaches this alveolus, this is where the air is. Oxygen moves from the air to the blood, again, down its gradient. But carbon dioxide moves from blood to air down its gradient. Here's another view of the alveoli and the three types of cells. So again, you can see most of these cells are type 1 cells. Those blue ones are type 2 cells. Sorry, the green ones are type 2 cells. The blue ones are the alveolar macrophages. And if you look to the right, then again, you can see this respiratory membrane and the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Well, since it's happening by diffusion, it has to be a short, short distance. As, dif as the distance increases, diffusion efficiency drops dramatically. So respiratory membranes are really, really, really thin. They're only about a half to one micron in thickness. Anything above one micron reduces the effectiveness of diffusion, and so we don't get gas exchange. And so if you think about what happens with pneumonia, pneumonia is an inflammation of these al alveoli, and so they swell, they get thicker, and so as they get thicker, if they get above one micron, it's very, very difficult to move oxygen. Even though there's plenty of air in the alveolus, you can't move it into the blood. It's very, very difficult to move carbon dioxide out of the blood. 
And that's why breathing is so difficult if you have pneumonia. Don't forget that we have a huge surface area. Remember, it's about the size of a doubles tennis court. And that's about 40 times the, the amount that you have of skin. So, we can't let this membrane get thick. If it swells, it becomes edematous. Gas exchange drops. We don't want to decrease the surface area because if you decrease the surface area, you don't have as much space for diffusion to happen. So things like emphysema, they decrease the amount of, of wall. The walls of adjacent alveoli separate and break through. And so instead of having many, many small alveoli, you have fewer large alveoli. Let's look at the lungs. So if you remember the lungs, uh, remember the right lung is bigger than the left one. They take up basically all of the thoracic cavity except the part where the heart's located. When you look at them, they have a point up at the top that's called the apex, and they have a flat bottom, which is called the base. You can see where the ribs impact or come into contact with the lungs. These are called costal surfaces. You can also see a sort of indented area where the pulmonary and systemic blood vessels enter and leave and where the, the bronchi enters um, the lungs. So if we look at the lungs, they look like this. So up at the top, there's the apex. Down at the bottom, there's the base. You can also see that the right lung has three lobes and the left lung only has two. What creates these lobes or separates these lobes are fissures. So there are two fissures on the right lung, but only one fissure on the left lung. Here's a pair of real lungs. And look, you can see the impression of the ribs. You can see the fissures. You can see the lobes and so on. The bronchi enter the lungs, and then the secondary bronchi enters a lobe, and then we see smaller and smaller and smaller bronchi until we get down to the alveoli. The left lung, remember, is smaller because of the location of the heart. And so there's a cavity in the side or on, against the wall of the left one that sort of accommodates the heart. And that's called the cardiac notch. There are two lobes on the left lung, and there's one fissure. It runs diagonally, so it's called the oblique fissure. If you look at the right lung, there's three lobes, so there are two fissures. There's an oblique one, but there's also one that runs sort of horizontally, so it's called the horizontal fissure. Remember the lungs are located in an enclosed cavity called the thorax or thoracic cavity. You can see it here. It's completely sealed off. They're protected by the ribs and the muscle and the skin and so on. Remember the thorax is separated from the abdominopelvic cavity by the diaphragm. In this picture, you can see all of that. You can also see the heart and you can see the cardiac notch. Not only that, but the lungs, remember, are surrounded by serous membranes. And if you remember, serous membranes are double-layered membranes. They're very thin. They're simple squamous. But there's two layers. There's one layer which touches the lung. That's called the visceral pleura. And there's one that does not touch the lung. It's adhered to the wall of the cavity. That's called the parietal pleura. So if we look at the parietal pleura, it uh, touches the wall of the cavity and the diaphragm. And here you can see those two layers. The visceral pleura is very tightly adhered to the lung and very difficult to get off. 
Don't forget that there's a space between the two pleura, and that's called the pleural cavity. So if you look at this picture, you can see this horizontal section. In the horizontal section, you can see the pleural cavity, and then you can see the visceral and parietal pleura. There's a separate pleural cavity for each lung. In this picture, you can also see the heart, and you can see the serous membranes around the heart. Remember, those are called pericardia. So we have a pericardial cavity and the visceral and parietal pericardium. This picture also shows you a good view of the hilum or hilus of the lung. It's this indented area on the medial surface of the lung where the bronchus and the blood vessels enter and leave the lung. The visceral pleura, remember, is adhered to the surface of the lung. There are two of these. Again, you can see this. In this picture, they have them colored differently. So the blue one is the parietal pleura, and the red one is the visceral pleura, and then that light blue is the pleural cavity. So that's the end of part one. Thank you for your attention.